All right, Matthew chapter 27, and we're going to get back into the study here. And uh, the verse number 26, and we are moving into the, the crucifixion. And last time we, we went down through, we got down to verse 25. We're going to pick up here in verse 26. And, and again, in the context here, uh, it's the hours just prior to the actual crucifixion of the Lord. And uh, he's been delivered into the hands of Pilate and is being tried. Pilate tries to let him go, and it doesn't work. The, the Israel won't let that happen, verse 26. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So again, remember Pilate had offered them a deal, uh, trying to get out of it, trying to uh, be a little smart here on his side. You know, he looks at him, gives him Barabbas, a, a notorious uh, a murderer, a robber. You know, we would call him a thug. And uh, he knew he thought for sure that the Jews would pick him over Jesus, so kind of give him an out. And uh, they didn't. They they wanted Jesus. They wanted Barabbas released. So then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now the scourging begins, and it's a very it's a very it's a terrible thing here. What they're going to do. Uh, verse 27, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and, knocked him, and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him, and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own garment on, his own raiment on, and led him away to crucify him. And that passage there uh, describes what Hebrews 12 verse 3 calls the contradiction of sinners against the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, really, it, it, the, this really goes all the way down to verse 44, and uh, we're not going to get all the way down there tonight, but that's really what we're looking at here. Uh, you're, you're seeing the Lord endure the hostility of man. Here's a bunch of soldiers. Uh, govern, verse 27 there, the, the soldiers of the governor. The, these were not the, um, the parade soldier. These were the professional soldiers. They were there under the authority of Caesar, uh, the Roman emperor. They're, they have uh, they understand what it is to deal with a king and, and uh, that's their enemy and considered to be enemy. Here they have a guy that claims to be king of the Jews. So we're going to deal with him the way we would on the battlefield, and they're going to they're going to they're going to they're going to torture him is what they're going to do. Uh, the Lord is literally a plaything with these guys. They're they're brutal. They're cruel, and uh, they they take him. There, verse twenty-seven. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus, uh, and again the, these guys are the professional soldiers, and uh, they, he's been delivered to them. That's what verse twenty-six said, and into their hands, and and he's literally going to be brutalized at this point. Come over with me to Psalms 129. And what we're going to see as we go down through this, Psalms 129, is we're going to see what the Psalms have said prophetically about all of this. And again, when you, when you read the Psalms, uh, some of them you'll get reading and you'll get looking at them and you go, man, is that talking about the Lord or is it talking about the little flock? You know, David, who's he talking? And really, you, you kind of go, well, wait a minute. It is talking about that tribulation little flock, which is what the book of Psalms is for, is who the book of Psalms is for. But really, when you begin to look at him, you understand that he's really talking about Christ, the Messiah, as he now is going to associate and as he is now going to be uh, numbered with them. 
and, and associated with them. And as he's numbered with the transgressions, he's been, he is identified with his people in their suffering. And that's really what we're going to see here as we move down through this. Notice Psalms 129, uh, verse 3. Now, this is describing something that, that, that took place when Christ was being scourged. Is that the wind? That's the wind, isn't it? Okay, thank you. Whew. thought maybe the, somebody was trying to get in the side door there. 29.3, the plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrow, furrows. See that plowed? He's talking about a plowman who sets the plow into the ground. And the psalmist is saying that, that, that what is happening to the Lord in the scourging is like taking the plow and digging it down deep into the ground, but rather now it's his flesh, it's his back and flaying him open. And uh, they call this thing the cat of nine tails, <laughs> you know. And you go look at that in an encyclopedia. I guess today you Google it. But back in the day, you went, and you know what you saw? You saw, you, you saw these great strands of, uh, of pieces of leather that had knots in them. It had broken metal in it. It had glass in it. It had pieces that were sharp. And when they beat the pers a person... That cat of nine tails would hit, and then they, they would rake it across his flesh and dig down in. And when that happened, come over to Isaiah 52. When that happens, it really just makes mincemeat of the guy's back. And that's literally what is happening here now with the Lord. They're brutalizing him. And again, these guys aren't amateurs. They know what they're doing. You know, you think about whipping someone and you go whack and then you pull it right back. They didn't do that. They hit him and then drug down, you know, and then pulled back. And they were just digging deeper. And the, they knew how to hit him. They knew where to hit. They knew the, the way to hit it to get the most effect out of the, the, the scourging. And they scourge him. They're subject, they're, they're putting him in total physical debilitation. They know what they're doing. They're good at it. And the psalmist says it's like a plowman breaking down that ground. But yet it's really down the back. And uh, that's what, really what's happening. If you look at Isaiah 50. Three, that chapter describes the crucifixion of Christ. It really starts back in 52. So look at Isaiah 52. Look at verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage, his appearance, was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The king shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. The idea in verse 14 there is that he was so marred. The idea there that he was humil humiliated. He's going to be exalted as king, but right now he's not. Right now he's being mutilated. And he was so marred that the people that knew who, knew who he was could not recognize him. And uh, when you see pictures of, of Christ hanging on the cross, you never see the true picture. Because if you did, nobody would, would put the pictures up. It was that grotesque. And you, if you think about what they're doing here to the Lord, they are... I mean, if you think about the brutality of it, uh, come back to chapter 50, Isaiah 50. There's Christ. He's going to have a broken nose. He's going to have blood all over his face, black eyes, abrasions, bruises, mouth, face swollen, lips protruding, teeth cracked, gums bleeding. His back's a bloody mess. His body has been racked. He, he's... He, he's just oozing blood. Now, that's a wonderful description, isn't it? But that's what it is. But what that pictures for you is what sin cost. You know, Isaiah 53, by his stripes we are healed. Now, that's Israel, 
okay? But he took a tremendous beating. And again, if you saw the real picture of what he really looked at, you take this stuff and uh, you wouldn't be able to, 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 you know, go have dinner. <laughs> it would just turn your stomach. If you look at Isaiah 50, verse 6, I gave my back to the smiters. There's Psalms 129.3 with the plow, with that, with that cat of nine tails. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Think about that. And that's really where we're at in Matthew 27. They'd reach up and poke him and spit on him. One would reach up and grab a piece of his beard and yank it out. You know, I don't, I don't know if you've ever, ever had anyone ever try to pull your hair. It doesn't feel good. And then when that's done, then they got a guy over there with the, with the, with the, thing, with the strap just beating on him. And uh, he's going through shame. I didn't hide my face from shame. Come back to Matthew 27. He didn't hide from the shame or the humiliation or the suffering or the, or the brutality of the moment. And that's what they did. See, they, he has released Barabbas and delivered him to be scourged, to be crucified. So then verse 27, what did they do? They scourge him. Now, if you follow down to verse 32, look at verse 32. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. He was so weak and in a weakened condition that he couldn't even carry his own cross. So they go get someone else to come up and carry the cross for him. He could barely carry himself to Golgotha. And that's the amount of physical torment that he's been through. And again, you have to remember, he, ha he, he was up all day. He's been up probably more than 24 hours he's been awake. It's daylight. It's early in the morning here. It's at 6 to 9 a.m. time period. They brought him the pilot. To get Pilate to kill him, after all those hours of sleepless and brutality, the mocking, the humiliation, after all that he does, he, he didn't have, by the way, he didn't have to take any of it. He's the son of God. But yet, what did he do? He took it. Verse 27, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of the soldiers. Again, when we read here about him being led away to be scourged, there was the whole mob was there. And he, they just used him as a play toy in their brutality. And he did it after the bloodthirsty cry of the people. These guys are serious about it. Verse 28, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They're going to mock him now. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it in his head, upon his head and a reed in his hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. You see that thing about the crown of thorns? The first, run back with me to Genesis 3. It's, it's important to see this. It's important to see what's happening here. Why the Lord is endured. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Why is he doing this? Well, look at Genesis 3, and look at verse 17 and 18, and here's where thorns first come into creation. Uh, now, by the way, the guys in Matthew 27 aren't getting this at all. They're not doing it for this, but, but there's a spiritual issue that's happening here. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat it, eat it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Th there was no thorns and thistles before the fall. Okay? A thorn, the thorns, is a sign. It's a symbol of the result of God's curse on creation because of man's sin. 
And when these guys take the crown of thorns, come back to Matthew 27, when they take and make that crown of thorns at the old house on 5th, there was a there was a thorn tree in the back, and I almost wanted to cut a piece and bring it with me. And those thorns were at least two to three inches long. And they were in a manner that they had wrapped around the old trailer, and, and I cut them, and you could literally wrap those things and lock them and make this. That was a fat... It was, but, Linda wouldn't let me take any with me because I wanted some, you know, because, but that's what it, so when they make this crown of thorns and they plate it, the big old spite, and they put it on him, and they don't just put it on him, they put it down in him, and it draws blood. That crown there was that symbol of the curse. And again, it ought to be precious to us because what did Paul say? that Christ was made a curse for us. The pictures here are tremendous. They bow the knee, and they make fun of him. They mock him. They ridicule him. They're just trying to to get him. And they they strip him naked. Verse uh, 27 there, 28, 29, they're 29. They put it upon his head. They bow the knee. Verse 30, they spit on him and took the reed and smote him on the head. Interesting, they smote him on the head. They just bloody, keep beating on him. They're just, they're getting him. And again, they, they make him so weak that he can't even carry his own cross. And that tree that they're going to hang him on, they, they have to get Simon, who, by the way, is a Gentile, out of the crowd to come and to take care of him. Verse, um, now, at verse 31, you see there at 30, and they smite on him and they beat on him. Then verse 31, and, and after that they had mocked him and they took the robe off of him and put his own raiment and led him away to be crucified. At verse 31, between the time that they put his raiment on him and they lead him to be crucified. This is where John 19, so come over to John 19, the first 16 verses happen. Because when John paints the picture in here, John is presenting Christ as the Son of God, as Messiah who is Jehovah. So in the context, John puts the interview that he has with the soldiers. And you find that they bring him back to Pilate. And Pilate, one last time, goes out to the people to try to get them to stop. And he stands before them bloody, beaten, a victim. He's been thoroughly, I mean, brutalized. And yet they still won't release him. 19.1, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. By the way, if you look at verse 40, 18.40, they cried, what? Not this man, but Barabbas. Let Barabbas, we want, we don't, that's where we're at in 27.26. Now you get this, and the soldiers plated a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe, and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again, and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Again, over and over again, Pilate, (laughs) the record says that he's what? A just man. He's innocent. I don't find any fault with him. There's nothing here. And yet they still want him killed. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and purple robe. And Pilate saith unto him, Behold the man. What a statement. If you want to want to behold the man, there he is. Look at Christ. If you want to see the man here, and you want to see man at his greatest. You know, people look at the arts and, you know, the... Uh, politicians and all that stuff 
And yet here, you, if you want to see man at his greatest, look here at Christ and see what's happening. Pilate is going to do something here because Pilate's a little shook up now because they know that who they're killing isn't the normal guy, the normal man. They're, they're beginning to realize that something is happening here. Now you'll notice in verse 5 that he, the crown of thorns and purple robe, and they bring him out, and Pilate says, Behold the man. You know what they didn't do? They didn't clean him up. They left him bloodied and bruised and brutalized. They didn't make him look good. They didn't do what they do on the TV when the guys get beat up. You know, they come and clean them up, and then they have their news conference. He didn't do that. He just drug him out there. Verse 6, when the chief priest, therefore, and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Pilate saying what? He's not guilty. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our laws we, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. There it is. He's been telling them all this time, I'm the Son of God. And that's what's got underneath, that's the little burr under their saddle. They didn't believe him. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more, notice, afraid. And went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Notice the question. Pilate knew he was from Galilee. He's already had that conversation. Luke 23 there, he found out he's from Galilee. What did he do? He sent him over to Herod. Herod sends him back. Okay. They, you know, his wife's telling him, don't have anything to do with this guy. You know, she's at home in the bed saying, leave him, stay away from him, don't get in there. Pilate knows something's up that isn't normal, that isn't there. He knows something supernatural is happening here. So he looks at Christ and says, where did you come from? What, you know, what planet are you from? <laughs> you know, he suspects something. So verse 10, then saith Pilate unto him, speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have the power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? And with that statement, Pilate is now guilty. Pilate had the power to release him, and he should have released him. But he didn't. Instead, he goes over and tries to wash his hands. You know, he, was, he wasn't guilty. But, but they said guilty, guilty, guilty. But you know what? He had the power to do right, and he refused to do it. And he refused to do it for personal considerations. Verse 11, Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. <coughs> the last words the Lord ever spoke, that Pilate ever heard, not the last words the Lord ever spoke, because he's going to talk seven more times from cross, but the last words that Pilate ever heard the Lord speak, look at the last word. Sin, the greater sin. You see, when Pilate heard those words, not a lot of comfort in those words. He had power to release him, but he didn't do it. Verse 12, And from henceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend, whosoever maketh uh, himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place which is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour. And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? Now notice, the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. 
at that moment they lost their their rank, their political clout as a nation. They're gone. Okay. Then delivered he therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And there's where we are back now to Matthew 27. So go back to Matthew 27. Look at that passage in John, because in Matthew 27, 32, they led him, into verse 31, they lead him away to be crucified, to crucify him. Well, in verse 31, there's that whole conversation again with Pilate there, John 19. Verse 32, and as they came out, they found a man of Syrian, Simon by name. They're going to go down now, they're going to go outside the city, they're going to go to Golgotha, to Calvary. But he's too weak to carry his own cross. So they find a man, Simon. Christ is walking out in front. Simon's carrying the cross behind him. But he's a Gentile from uh, Syrian. He he is a strong man, carries a cross for the Lord behind him. But they compelled, him they compelled to bear his cross. Now, this is the greatest illustration of substitution in the Bible, okay? To whom did the cross belong? Whom was the, who should have been on that cross? Barabbas. But who wound up on it? Christ. I think of, you think about Barabbas, the, uh, the son of the father, his name is, Okay? Here he is, he's a wicked failure, he's a murderer. Could you imagine being Barabbas that day? You're in chains, you're down in the prison, you're in there, and you hear the steps coming, and you hear the, the guy go, walk in the mile, walk in the mile, here they go, you know, the Green Mile, the movie, walk in the mile, walk in the mile, here we go, you know, all this stuff. And, and you know what's, he's going, he's turning sheet white. You know he is, all, every, he knows he's going to go die, because here comes the jailer, and they get him, And they take him up in front of Pilate, and Pilate looks at him and says, You're free. Unshackle him. Let him go. You see, when Christ hung on the cross, it wasn't his. It was Barabbas' cross. So you have a great illustration here of substitution of him dying in the stead of another. It's his cross now, though, and he's ready to go with it. Now, you have Simon here, a man of... Cyrene bears his cross, and it's interesting. Do you remember somebody else with the name of Simon? Simon Peter. And it's appropriate here that it was a Simon, it was a Simon, wasn't Simon Peter, but a Simon, who bore the cross for the Savior. Peter had said, I'll not forsake you, I won't leave you, I won't let anything happen to you, yet where is Peter? He's hiding over in the crowd. Peter's off, he's gone. He's out weeping bitterly over his failure. And yet there stands another Simon. He's got the cross. To really remind you of one's failure and another's faithful. And uh, sometimes you look at that word Simon, that name, and you look it up in the dictionaries, the Bible dictionaries and stuff. And it carries a definition of one that is obedient Um, to hearken to, to listen to, to hear, so they become obedient. And actually what you see here is really an impact of another chord. Um, Come over to Mark 15. Notice something here. You would never notice this unless you read Paul in Romans 16. And so we're going to go there in just a second. Look at Mark 15. Mark 15. Simon, there's something here, Mark 15, 21. And they compelled one Simon, a, Syri- a, a, Syri- a Syrian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Now notice his two boys are listed there, Alexander and Rufus. Now come over to Romans 16. Romans 16. It's interesting here. Why in the world would he put the boys' names in the passage? You know, well, you wouldn't catch this unless until you got Paul in Romans 16 and verse 13. 16, 13. 
salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Now, I, there's no doubt in my mind, you can argue if you want, but I won't let you argue, I won't argue with you, but this is the same Rufus. And the thing is, is his mother is Simon's wife, his mother, and they were very dear to the Apostle Paul. Now notice, Ruf, chosen in the Lord, Rufus isn't a member of the body of Christ. He's a proselyte because this event here, think about Simon and his two boys are standing here, out walks Christ. He didn't walk out, drug out. They look at Simon, big Arnold Schwarzenegger type guy, I don't know, maybe, big strong strapping guy, and go, and the impact here that had on, on, they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, not just as one for whom he bore the cross, but one who became their savior as well. And his family even became faithful followers and help ministers together with the Apostle Paul at a later date, so much so that he says what? Your mom was like a mom to me. She took care of me as well. And that's what Paul means there. Now, in Romans 16, we have, we're not there in our study in Romans yet. When we get over there, you will see Paul list a lot of the circumcision believers there. Uh, I love verse 7, the end of that verse there, who also were in Christ before me. And you want to see the idiots take a run. Oh, my goodness. Well, look, that, you know, see what that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, wait a second. Mankind is in either two categories. They're either in Adam or they're in Christ, no matter the dispensation. And I say the idiots are, you know, run I, I, with all loving and gracious speech as possible. But they run out. See, look, Paul's, my, Paul's gospel was being preached and by the Lord. And then, no, it's not. Then if that's the case, Paul's a liar. And the, so is the Holy Spirit. So let's sell the buildings and close up shop and go fishing and move to the country when we get out of the craziness. See? See, you, you, you know, people, instead of stopping and being quiet and study it and look at it, so here you've got guys, again, go back to Matthew 27, you've got Rufus show up, <laughs> and he's meant, and, but you have Simon here go, and he's going to help the Lord. And again, just a little sidelight there about why this guy Simon, but yet Mark 15, he mentions his two boys. Romans 16, Paul mentions him. Because this event happened, and it left such a, wow, who is this guy to deserve that? And somebody says, well, he is Jehovah. He is the Savior. And whether Rufus and those guys, I'll kind of qualify what I said a minute ago, believe Paul's gospel or not, I, you can't really say. But the thing is, is they became believers, and they begin to follow here. Verse 33, Matthew 27, 33, And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. Now come over to Luke 23. Because in this moment, Luke 23, 33, you have to catch something. In Matthew 27, it's called the, the place is called Golgotha. In 23, Luke 23, 33. Luke, oh, I'm in 22. No wonder it didn't look right. It's got to have the word Calvary in the verse. <laughs> Luke 23, 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and so on. They called the place Calvary. We sing a song. At Ca he died on Calvary. At Calvary. You know, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. That's a, okay. Knowing not it was for me, he died on Calvary. The only time that word occurs in your English Bible is right there, Luke 23, 33. Every new Bible that I've ever looked at, even the New King James Bible, Either the New King James puts a footnote on it that says it ought to be omitted, or actually it ought to be changed to the place of the, called the skull, because that's what Calvary means, the skull. 
If you look at all the new Bibles, they pulled Calvary out and they put the skull. So it really messes up your hymn book, <laughs> okay? They don't have the word Calvary in the new Bibles, period. And they do that because it, it severs a link that we have with our past history of being connected to the Protestant Reformation. And it's important to maintain that. So they come out, they call this place, go back to Matthew 27. They call it Golgotha, that is to say the place of the skull. That is to say what? Calvary. And they come there and they're going to crucify him. Now, they lay out the cross on the ground. The soldiers are going to bring him over. They're going to lay him on it. They're ready to stretch out his hand on it and strike the, the, the nail in it, pierce his hands. They're ready to stretch out the other arm, lay it down and nail it. They're, they, then they're going to place one foot over the other foot and put a spike through the, both feet. Place the, you know, place, they're laying him out. So what do they do? By the way, they pick up that cross and they drop it down in a hole that they've dug. So it'll stand up. Now, if you can Im just imagine that jolt to the system. They've ju they just nailed him. They're going to raise him up. They're going to drop him in. And, the, and his body weight is going to pull on those nails. The spike would have been through, uh, driven at the base of the palm in the soft spot right there. And now, by the way, that's one of the stronger points on, on, your, on your frame, where those joints come together there. You know, that's why when people commit suicide, they usually cut right there when you got a pretty good vein running through there. But it's also a soft area, but it's also deadly. They got a spike in, a spike in, spike in. They place him easiest places to shed his blood on his feet and his hands, and they drop him down into that hole, and it just wham. So what did they do? They gave him vinegar, verse 34, to drink mingled with gall. Gall was a drug. Gall was like our morphine. Okay, they were trying to give him some painkillers. And uh, they, the, again, these are professional soldiers. They know what's coming. They know how people are going to react because they've done it before. You think about, there had to have been at least five or six soldiers there to hold him down. One on, you know, hold his arms down, his legs, his torso. Because as they're pounding in the spike, what is a normal person doing? Thrashing, screaming. That's what men do. So they're, they're going to give him a drug to, to dull the pain. Verse 34, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. The Lord wouldn't take the drug to kill the pain. Nothing was going to lessen. Nothing was going to modify the punishment that he was to suffer. He's going to take it unmixed, unmingled, straight on. By the way, he doesn't scream. Isaiah 53 says that he's dumb, silent. That's why these guys look around and go, that centurion here in a little bit is going to say, that truly is the Son of God we just killed. They come to spike him. Verse 35, and they crucify him. Boy, those four words, tremendous. They stretched him out. They've nailed him. They beat on him. He can't even carry his own cross. He's so weak. Up goes the tree. Down comes the weight. The agony. They come to give him a little help on the pain. He doesn't take it. He just lays it out. It's done. And again, those soldiers have never seen anyone like this. And again, that's that Isaiah 53 verse 7 where he's Yet he opened not his mouth, and he was brought to the lamb to the slaughter, and the sheep, so he's dumb, so he opened not his mouth, that verse ends. Man, when he just he laid it down. He didn't flinch. He didn't whimper. He just, get it done, boys. Let's get it over with. 
Verse 35, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast their lots. Key to notice here what they did with his, with his garments. They stole them. Again, think about the picture. He's hanging there stark naked. Bruised, beaten to a bloody pulp, exposed to the world hanging there. Remember what Adam and Eve did? They were ashamed because they knew they were what? Naked. He's naked. Naked as a jaybird, as they would say. You see, folks, Christ is bearing our shame there on the cross. And he bore it in full view for every sin ever committed. For every mean, nasty thing you ever did. For every rotten, self-righteous thing you ever did. All of it. That's what he did. When they parted his garment, just write down because of time, Isaiah 61.10. That's what they're fulfilling there. It says there that he hath clothed him with the garments of salvation, he hath covered him with the robes of righteousness. And that's what's happening there. They crucified him. They parted, they took away his garments while he's providing the garments of salvation for us, for all of mankind. And he, he's pr providing a robe of righteousness that we can wrap ourselves in so that we can stand holy, righteous before God. That's a wonderful thing here, right in the middle of all of it. Verse 36, and sitting down, they watched him there. They don't leave. I know what the movies show, they put him up and then the soldiers go away. They don't. They don't just do the deed. They stick around. They're not going to leave him to die. They're going to stay right there and torment him. They're going to make sure that it's all done. <laughs> Look at verse 37. And set over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Look at that. Three different times that title, that sign is put up there. Okay? And they're different in each time. John, Mark, and Luke, and, Ma and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're, they're, they're different. If you'll notice verse 37 carefully, the accusation was set up over his head. That's why you know the cross was in a T shape, like it's on the front of this pulpit. Why it's down. Sometimes you'll hear people say it was up and it was a. Uh, T, you know, a T like that, but not if they're going to put a sign above his head. So they drop it down a little bit, you know, kind of like what we, what you really normally see. That's where that comes from. They write above his head. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Now, there are three times this is, it says, in John, Matthew, and Luke, it says, and set up over his head his accusation written. Mark doesn't say his accusation. Come over to Mark 15. And I'll just It's a very interesting thing here. Mark 15 and verse 26. Mark 15, 26. And the superscription of his accusation was written over... The king of the Jews. See how it's a little different? Now come on to John. John is the first one that they write. John 19. Look at John 19. John 19. 19, 19. John 19, 19. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. That's the first one. The second one is in Matthew. So they put up one, and they pull it down, and what did they take out? Did you catch what they took out? Nazareth. What name were, did the chief priests and the elders tell everybody to stay away from? Not Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. So they yanked that out of there. Verse 20, this title then read many of the Jews, 
For the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Again, think about it. Many Jews saw that what? Jesus, that clicked in their head of who, who this was. Because he's bloodied. His appearance is marred. They can't recognize him. Pilate puts that Jesus of Nazareth, and now they know who, the, who it is. See, The chief priests, the religious, they don't want that. They just want a bloody mess hanging there. So they take it down and put Jesus, the king of the Jews. You'll notice the title's written in three languages. These are the three languages that represent the three men on the earth, the three boys of, of Noah. But it also rec- uh, represents the Jew, the Roman, and the Greek, and Jerusalem. Think about that. Hebrew, there's Israel, Jerusalem. Greek, there is Rome and Athens. And then you have Latin, and there's the philosophy, the wisdom of the Greeks and all of that. So you're seeing in the inscription over the cross what God is saying to man's religion, to his power, the Romans, to his philosophy, the Greeks, to the greatness of all men, as he points to the cross and he says, that's what your work did. Look at your work, mankind. Look at your handiwork. Do you see, come back to Matthew 27, do you see what your work did? As God looks at Calvary and he says, hey, here's Jesus, king of the Jews. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews there, verse 30. He's like, and it's written in the three languages. By the way, Luke 23, 38 is the other place this title is found. And it says it's written in three languages. Hebrew, the known languages of the world. Look at your handiwork, man. That's what your wisdom got. That's what your power got. That's what your religion got. And they didn't like that inscription up there, so they told Pilate, take it down. Pilate says, what I've written... I have written. By that time, Pilate was disgusted with them. He's through with them. He finally put his foot down a little too late. But it wasn't much, but it was something. And he says, it's going to stay up there, guys. Then you look at Matthew 27, 38. Then... Were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left? And there's that passage again, Isaiah 53. He's numbered with the transgression, transgressors. He hangs up there and he dies just like a common thief. He's dying like a criminal with the criminals. And I know what happens. You read books and everybody goes, well, you've got, you know, one, one here, one here. And when the soldier comes around to break their legs, he breaks... It doesn't make sense that he would break his leg on one side, the guy, on the one side, and then skip Jesus and go over and break the other, and then come back to Jesus. But yet, what does that verse say? One's on the right hand, one's on the left hand. Actually, if you read Bullinger, he's got like five or six or eight guys hanging here. You know, just crazy stuff. But that's, by the way, that's what Bullinger does. If you read Bullinger's stuff on the Gospels, Peter denied three times, and he says things just a little different, So you read Bullinger, he rolls that thing out to like six denials because it's just a little different rather than just understanding why Peter is doing what he's doing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's kind of oddball. Anyway, he's numbered. Verse 39, and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. And there's Psalms 22 when he says, I'm surrounded by the bulls of Bashan. And they're just sitting there going, they're just too bad, too bad. We knew it all along. If he would have just, verse 40, what are they saying? Thou that destroyeth the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Matthew chapter 4, you know what Satan said? If thou be the Son of God, command those stones to be made bread. They are mimicking their dad, their father, the devil. That's, what the, that's all they're doing. If, verse 40, If thou be the Son of God, 
come down from the cross. Likewise also, the chief priest mocking him, and the scribes and the elders said, by the way, it's, that's Psalms twenty-two twelve. 12. He saved others. By the way, up there in verse 40, when they said, destroyed the temple and build us, that's what the accusers had said in, in, in Caiaphas' trial. But that ended up being false. It's not what was said. They're just repeating the lie. Verse 42, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Isn't that interesting? You know, it wasn't time for him to come down from the cross. It wasn't time for him to um, come back and get them. There will be a day when he's going to come back. They're mocking him. The chief priests, the scribes, the religious leader of that name, a bunch of thieves, they're all just mocking him. Again, they're confused about his word. That thing in verse 40, he never said what they said he said. Verse 42, they're, con- they're about he saved others. Himself he cannot save. They're confused about his work. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. They're confused about what he's doing. They're confused. The end of verse 42, If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we'll believe him. He trusted God. Let him deliver him. You know what they're confused about there? About what God's doing. See, it's the hour of darkness. That's where we're going to pick up. In verse 45, it wasn't God's will for him to come down at this time. It's coming. Verse 43, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have. You know, verse 43, is, uh, it's got a sting in it with, from him. If he will have him. You know, we have him up there. See, if God will have him, if God was his father, what would he do? He'd come and get him. There's mockery. There he hangs. You see, <clears throat> what did the Lord say to Peter? You remember? If I need help, all i got to do is whisper a word, and the, the Father will send 12 legions of angels down here. He didn't need help. They missed that. I hope you get the idea of what's going on here. They are... They, they beat him. They brutalized him. Verse 45, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We'll pick up there because of the time, but I hope you get the idea of what's going on here. Do you know what it's like to be near deliverance, to have it right within your grasp, to be able to get it and then have a hostile mob deny your Savior, deny your faith? That's where they're at. But that's where he was. He stayed. He stuck it out because he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And now we're going to see, we we'll pick up here in verse 45, guess what? There's a deeper chasm here than just hanging a guy on a tree. Now it's going to move into that battle on the cross in these three hours of darkness where God reaches out, pulls down the, covers up the, the, the you know, the ninth hour, and he's going to hide out the sun, going to darken out the sun, you see. Now it's time for the divine judgment on man's sin. And that's where we're at. You see, folks, this is, I mean, we just kind of read down through it and talked a little bit about it, the brutality of it, because what is he doing now? Now he's going to die the spiritual death, our second death. And he's going to come through here, and he's going to deal with the adversary. We'll look at this next time. We've studied the battle on the cross in the past in great detail. 
where he says there in Isaiah, who's going to contend with him? Let him come. Let my adversary come. And Satan's going to show up, and they're going to literally... Psalms 22 is a great... What's happening here? He's down and pulling down into the mire. And he says, I am but a worm. And uh, the New Bibles butcher that up too, by the way. <laughs> and a worm there, I'm not a man, I'm a worm. Talking about the spiritual condition that the Lord is now in as he's paying our sin penalty and sin debt. So I hope you get what's going on here. It's not, it's not Sunday school at the, at the church, tiptoe through the roses or the, days, the tulips or whatever. This is a brutality. And when they hang him on that cross, he's a bloody mess. And if I'll be honest with you, if it wasn't for Pilate's plaque above his head, no one would have ever known who he was. That's why they wanted him to take it down. <laughs> Pilate says, nope, you're going to leave that up there. Okay? We'll pick up in verse 45 now next time as we go through. We only have a handful of uh, lessons left. We're coming to the end here of... Chapter 20 of the, of the book, we'll finish out, you know, the chapter and get and talk about the resurrection stuff. So, you know, we'll be done here pretty quickly, but I don't want to lose the importance of what's going on. The other thing you have to notice is Matthew depicting him as a king. He's got a crown of thorns, he's got the robes, and yet you see the violence of the, of the hands of an enemy king in the hands of the Roman soldiers, and that's brutality brutal okay but he did it all for the joy that was set before him he endured the cross hebrews 12 2 you know he became obedient under the even under the death of the cross he did it for mankind as we understand paul's revelation that capstone of, of calvary and looking back at what's going on it's a tremendous thing okay all right dearly father we thank you for the evening lord we thank you for the look here into your death the things around it, and as we study it, we would just sit in awe of what you went through for us. And thank you for that, and give you the honor and the glory and the praise uh, in our lives for what you've done for us. In your name we pray. Amen.